Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Osasu Show. Nigeria, Africa's biggest economy, has recorded the worst percentage of women participation in politics and electoral process. According to the Global Index of the World Economic Forum, Nigeria ranks 135 out of 144 countries. On today's program, we'll be talking about women's participation in politics and what can be done to advance this participation. Don't go anywhere and we'll be right back on The Osasu Show. Elections and election periods are crucial in a life of any democracy. To this end, the electoral umpire in Nigeria, the Independent National Electoral Commission, is taking giant strides to fortify election process in the country and consolidate on previous successes. Hence, as part of their sensitization moves, the Commission, on the 20th of June 2018, organized a workshop on women participation in the continuous voter registration and collection of permanent voters card. Major issues discussed by INEC officials include the electronic collation and transmission of election results, INEC provision for people with disability, registration of women in IDP camps among other things. As 2019 general elections beckons, it becomes incumbent on INEC to discharge its constitutional mandate without trepidation or prejudice. It can affect the whole country. You vote the right people in or you vote the wrong people in just for marginalizing some of the votes that came in. So what we did is to ensure that at the PU level, because the PU level is the, I say that the foundation of all elections. Yeah. Everybody knows everybody. Yes. It's in your village, yes. your town. Yes. Nobody can come there and say, I want to vote. You say, ah, we don't know this person. Yes. So what we did is to ensure that when the vote is cast at the PU, it is automatically sent to our database. These are the reasons why you cannot get your card immediately. There are so many processes after the data capture. The first is the memories have been printed, you come for Clinton, and now it's one week. Then we do data conclusion, another one week. Now, when you are comparing, the system takes time. And this is a system that was run with power 24 7. That was the NEPA, that was the generator, that was the. Uh, you, every, any source of power. The basic way in, in the PU, they count the results where they have all the um, representatives of the parties there. And after doing that, because I've been to one of these things, they raise it up and tell you who I want. So everybody knows the result. After they input the results on the EC1, they ensure that everybody looks at it to be sure that this is the result. And they sign, all the party members sign the result, even the police. So when the person is inputting the result in the, in the app, they are also looking at it. Nigerians will not let you put anything without them looking at it. So we look at it, and then the person, before you send it, has to input a password. This password is generated from, um, from the HQ. The password is for everybody that is sending results. Different passwords, individual passwords. But remember that everything is being calculated, not by human beings now, don't work by a computer that tells you all the collation of all the results is calculated and verified before it is validated. 
So I think we're doing pretty well, that's for sure. All right, thank you very much. Our forms now have uh, uh, any disability, yes or no. If the disability state the disability, then our software also has a provision for special registration for people with disability that has to do with the hand that cannot do uh, fingerprint uh, capture. When you click special registration, it pops up a camera, it snaps the hand to confirm that it cannot press, and then we register the person and the person get the card. Thank you, Mr. Holland, Mr. Moses, for your wonderful presentation. My question is on nine people there. I visited the camp in Masarawa Brugu and nine other camps in 2016. And when we tried to get um, solicit for funds or intervention for the women there, we were told that those camps are not government recognized IDP camps. And you mentioned that you go to camps. So do you go to all camps or you go to government recognized IDP camps to register the women? In my program, I bring the studio to the street and interact with everyday Nigerians, taking their worries, their concerns, their questions directly to the ears of their leaders. Senate President Bukola Saraki, Distinguished Senator Rabiu Musa Kwankwaso, His Excellency in Yensom Wike, Governor Okeze Victor Ikbeazu, the Executive Governor of Benue State, Samuel Otto. We interrogate the policies and objectives of key stakeholders in the political and development sector to ensure that the impact trickles down to the poorest of the poor in our society. This is where they have most of them, their brain don't, don't work. But do you agree that there were accusations that you made during the campaign that were not necessarily founded? Me? Yes. So what do they call the incident of October 2006? No impeachment. That's, they call it rascality. Rascality. My goal is to dig deep and find the truth. Then give meaning, understanding, and solution to it. Welcome back to the Osasu Show. With me right now is Mrs. Mufuliat Fujabi, who is the CEO of Women Trust Fund, and Adora Nyechere, who is the anchor of Kakaki and Gender Agenda. Thank you so much for joining me, ladies. Thank you, Osasu. It's good to be here. So I will start off with you. Um, the global statistics for women's participation in uh, governance is about 22.5 percent across the african region but in nigeria we've seen it's only a meager 6.7 percent what do you attribute the statistics to well when women do not have equal playing field to win elections and win elective um, seats it's obvious that the percentage will continue to be down and nigeria is one of the countries um, that ranks you know um, lowest in terms of women's participation in, the, um, in democratic um, processes. And um, if you look at other countries in Africa, you know, Senegal, look at um, Rwanda, South Africa, the percentage of women who occupy elective positions are quite high. You know, in fact, almost times two, three, four of uh, what we have in Nigeria. In Rwanda, we have the parliament made up of 70% of women. Why can't we see a replication of that in Nigeria? For, for those countries, they have um, political will, they have affirmative action, they have um, a kind of a commitment to ensure that women play a key role in the governance of their country. And for us, we have a national agenda policy which has been in place since 2006 that um, recommends 35% affirmative action for women. But there's no real commitment. There's no deliberate action, you know, such as um, providing the necessary um, support to ensure that women actually um, get that minimum of 35%. Well, the president just passed a not too young to run bill into law, which sees uh, more young people, especially 25 years and um, older, being able to vie for political positions of power. Do you believe that this would enhance the um, uh, possibility of women in politics? I think, you know, 
let's take it a step backwards. What made the not too young to wrong bill come into place in the first place? Young people were agitating, they were mobilizing, they were coming together to say enough is enough. We need a fair playing ground for more young people to become, you know, acknowledged in leadership position for the sake of capacity and enabled by, you know, some level of exposure. I think beyond the conversation of not too young to wrong bill, the bill is all encompassing. It encompasses the, the disabled, it encompasses women and, and young women, it encompasses the young men, and it, it, it encompasses the professionals. But also, as I think for women, I think mobilizing the right way, the voices in uniformity, what are we asking for, what do we want, what are our priorities and what are the structures. The Not Too Young to Run movement was very very intense. It was persevering, it was consistent, it was structured. You saw a number of youths come together under Yaga and some members of the Nigerian Youth Association say, you know what, let's come together and move this forward. How are women mobilizing? I mean, we saw the gender equality bill at the National Assembly. Yes, it passed at the National Assembly in the House of Representatives, but it failed in the Senate. Now, what have women done since then, what have we done to come together and say, we need an action plan, a policy document that will drive the conversation at the legislature. Perhaps if we have a law governing the movement, then we can say yes, we have some sort of structure moving forward. But even within the not too young to run bill context, women will still need to mobilize intentionally to be able to drive their agenda within the bill. Because again, remember us as it's still just an act and the constitution is still not binding. So even the not too young to run bill is like a dot check. We still have to do a constitutional amendment for the not too young to run act to actually become implemented. So that's so another legal uh, conversation Absolutely. that a lot of people have been wondering, is the not too young to run bill or law, I should say, now implementable? Some lawyers have said yes, young people can go out there and pick up their um, uh, nomination forms and some people, some lawyers have argued no. But that's a conversation for a different time. Uh, there has also been an argument about what women can do. We've had a lot of talk shops with demanding for women's rights, affirmative action, but a lot of people feel that some women are not putting in the work. So for example, during the APC primary elections in Ikiti State, there were two women who were vying for the gubernatorial seat and they got one delegate votes each which were possibly their votes. So what is the issue? Do you believe that women are mobilizing, as Adora said earlier, enough? Are they creating that grassroots support that is needed to win election? Because there's no affirmative action that's going to win you an election uh, in your state, right? So how do women do that, especially due to the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund, uh, which was created in 2011, which is to see that more women are involved in governance. What are some measures that you've put in place to educate women on how to properly politic? Okay, first I'd like to state that um, when you talk about women's political participation, one structure that women need to deal with all the time is that of patriarchy. And patriarchy is very strong. It's like an amoeba. You know, it changes shapes at different times. It has become a generational issue. And it's, just, it's not just only in Nigeria. So if, you, if we compare it to the Not Too Young to Run um, Act now, you know, the struggle was against two different um, issues. One was age, one was the advocacy around inclusion. But for women and the Gender and Equal Opportunity Bill, it's more about patriarchy, the notion of male control. You know, it's very difficult to deal with. And that's why it's not that women are not mobilizing or networking, you know, but if you look at the structures, you know, of the political parties that um, produce um, these um, women, you have the delegates there. Who are the delegates? Mostly men, you know. And when you talk about um, resources to mobilize also, women do not have the kind of resources, you know, that some of the men have. Why so, is that? Whose fault so, is that? Yes, we need to overhaul the entire uh, concept and structure of patriarchy. It's not something that just started now. It's been there for ages. You know, you go to the um, National Assembly, people have their uh, patriarchal rooted in religious interpretations, cultural interpretations, you know. So the kind of mobilizing and support that women do and give one another 
is not without this challenge. Very valid, but um, let me touch on this. The deputy governorship role has always been relegated to women, or we're seeing more governors relegate that role to women. What's your reaction to that? Do you believe this is a step in the right direction, or do you believe that this is another way to subvert you know, uh, what women can actually achieve? by going for the top, going for that governorship role or the presidential role? Actually, in terms of mobilizing women for political participation, we also encourage what we call training, you know, where you have a male um, chair, you should have a female deputy chair, or where you have um, a female chair, you should have a deputy male chair. Training is something that is also encouraged because then it also provides the space and opportunity for women to also um, occupy leadership position and also with the prospect of um, taking a stronger uh, position you know in the scheme of um, um, things so training is something that is encouraged you know so it, we don't see it as relegating women to the background rather it also provides the necessary exposure it's also it also provides the um, necessary experience that would assist women you know in performing other leadership tasks okay very lastly, Adora, we hear you have some um, political aspirations for the State House of Assembly in Imo State. Um, any truth to this? Well, first of all, I'll say that um, you know, service is not by coloration or by age or by mandate, it's by willingness. I think, first of all, I would like to say um, in all my years of working, I have also understood my state team of state, and something has been very clear. There are very few voices of women in leadership position. Uh, you just talked about deputizing, you know, for women. We have never experienced that. Um, to cut the long story short, I believe that women have the capacity and the intention to do what they are asked to do and even do more because they're very innovative. And I believe that if you look at the whole cross-section of the State Assembly, in all of the State Assemblies in Nigeria, you have only at least 25% of women representation. I think my state has about 3.5%. So I believe that going forward, leadership, it's about readiness, it's about capacity, and I think that is something that I'm willing to give. And I do believe that under the mandate of a leadership who is willing to work with women. It's one thing to say you want to serve, but another thing is the enabling environment in which you talked about. We have a seeming case of misogyny in so many states. How do we break that? First, we have to look at the political parties. How are they endorsing female candidates and how are they creating an enabling environment for participation? On one side, they tell you that, oh, when you pick up you know, your form is free, but campaigning is not free, endorsements are not free. So going forward, what are the avenues in raising funds, resource and financial mobilization? How are the men usually? doing it? First of all, you have a criteria whereby the God for Darism, now they've moved it away and called it mentorship, you know, that the mentorship for the young men are consistent. Why don't the women get godfathers or mentors as well? Or god or god or god or godmothers. Or godmothers. Some of the women mothers. also have. The women yeah. also have. Yeah, right. Also so have. that's another you know, but the, the challenge is that the godfatherism thing has been there for ages and the men have benefited a lot from it. And that's what strives in most political parties. Women have also benefited but not as much as the men have done. I, I think and um, finally Osaji if you let me I, I think how well have Nigerian followed the policies that we are signatories to? I mean, the Beijing Conference in 1995 has been a long document. We're in 2018. What are the punitive measures for countries that do not play allegiance to those treaties? The SDG number five goal is gender. How are women streaming women in the politics? I believe that there should be some action by the government through the international communities to say, this country, if you have not put in at least 35% into mainstreaming gender, we would hold our aids from you, we would hold our, our expertise from you, and we probably put you on a blacklist. Well, something like that. Because the only reason why Rwanda is able to excel is because it took a genocide to be able to give them a, recent, a sense of recalibration because they had less women in government. But we don't need a genocide. We don't even need a war for us to be able to recalibrate and say, you know what? If we have more women in place, poverty will reduce. If we have more women in place, rural development will increase. If we have more women in place, there will be a harmonious ad adventure of leadership for us in Nigeria. Well, that's a fine place to leave it, but as they say, 
power is never served a la carte. We must all work <laughs> for it and yeah. strive to be in those positions of power that we seek. Thank you so much, women, for joining. Ladies, for Thank joining you. me on today's program. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a short so break much. right now, and when we return, we'll take you through some of the initiatives of the Osasu Show Foundation. Don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back on the Osasu Show. I'm 17 years old. I'm in SS1. I'm a student of Government Science Secondary School, Cal National State. I just received a scholarship from Ms. Osasu Show Foundation. I want to say a very big thank you to her. Thank you for the scholarship you gave to me. May the Almighty God bless you. You will never lack in your life. I say a very big thank you that the Almighty God will always bless you and your family. That you shall never lack in your, in your life. I'm 14 years old. I schooled at Government College, Kefi. I just received a scholarship from Osasu Show Foundation to continue my studies. May God bless her and continue to bless her in Jesus' name. I believe that I'm unstoppable. I believe I've only just begun. I mean, I'm, I'm 16 years old. I'm in Government College, Kefi. I'm just three. I want to thank Osasu Show for giving me scholarships so that I will go back to school. I am 17 years. I just received financial support from the Osasu Show Foundation to complete my education. And I still hope that the Osasu Show Foundation will, support, will still give me support to complete my education up to the university level. Thank you and God bless you. I'm the coordinator of Shining Light Kingdom Builders Church Children's Outreach. Um, we have been sponsoring children uh, in school for the past five years. Um, uh, we have over 50 children that we have been helping. Um, the time has come where we need uh, assistance, more financial help from uh, the public and we are grateful that uh, the Osasu Show has stepped in to assist us and partner with us and has given these children scholarship so that they may continue their education and reach the heights which they are capable of reaching. Some of them are just finishing uh, JS3, some have finished SS1, SS3 and are hoping to go to university. So we're very grateful to the Osasu Show for stepping in to sponsor their education. Thank you, Osasu Show Foundation. That's it for today's program. To watch extended clip of this episode, you can visit our website www.tostvnetwork.com. Don't forget, our initiative, The People's Candidate, is still very much on. Nominate who you want to be president. In 2019, by visiting our website forward slash TPC. Follow us on social media at the Osasu Show, at TOS TV Network, at Osasu Ibnadion, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'll see you same time, same place next week. And until then, take very good care of yourself. God bless you.